In the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, amen. I'd like to welcome you all to our Perseverance Family Conversation, and as always, it's great to be with you. So as is our custom, we like to start off our family conversation by inviting our mother to be with us. That mother is Mary Most Holy. Mary is the mother of God. Mary is the mother of the church. Mary is the mother of each and every one of us. We cry out to Mary as our life, our sweetness, and our hope. Also, we are in the month of October, which is the month of the Holy Rosary. So let's uh, say that prayer that Mary loves so much. And that prayer is the Hail Mary. Together. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for our sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. What a blessing it is to have a spiritual director who is God himself. Our spiritual director is the Holy Spirit. So let's uh, beg the Holy Spirit who has many beautiful titles. One of the titles is that of Paraclete. Another title would be he is the gift of gifts. In the sequence for Pentecost, we call out to the Holy Spirit as the sweet guest of our souls. The Holy Spirit is known, known also as our consoler in the midst of our trials. He's also known <clears throat> as our counselor. He's the one that will give us good advice. The Holy Spirit is our interior master. St. Paul says we don't know how to praise we ought, but the Holy Spirit intercedes with ineffable groans so that we can say Abba. Abba, which means daddy or father. That'll be our conversation today. We're going to be going through that prayer that our Lord taught us, the Abba, the Our Father. So let's uh, invite the Holy Spirit to be with us, to enlighten our minds with great light, fill our hearts with joy, and that that divine fire that descended upon the apostles would descend upon us. So let's pray the prayer to the Holy Spirit and open our minds, our hearts, our souls to God's invasion from his Holy Spirit, as we say. Come, Holy Spirit, fill the hearts of your faithful and enkindle within us the fire of your divine love. Send forth your spirit, and they shall be created. And thou shalt renew the face of the earth. Let us pray. O God, who did instruct the hearts of your faithful by the light of the Holy Spirit, grant us by the same Spirit we might be truly wise and ever rejoice in his consolation through the same Christ our Lord. Amen. Our Lady of the Rosary, pray for us. St. Joseph, pray for us. St. Michael, pray for us. St. Gabriel, pray for us. St. Raphael, pray for us. St. Ignatius, pray for us. St. Faustina, pray for us. St. Bruno, pray for us. Blessed Marie Rose de Rocher, pray for us. All God's angels and saints, pray for us. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. So, my friends, as always, I will promise to pray for all of you. And I'd like to pray for you on the Opus Dei. The Opus Dei means the work of God. And the Opus Dei is the holy sacrifice of the Mass. From the rising of the sun to a setting, 
a pure sacrifice will be offered to you. We read in the book of Malachi. So in the whole world, at every time, the holy sacrifice of the Mass is being celebrated. I will place you on the altar, and I'll offer these intentions. First will be that all of us would take seriously the universal call to holiness, that all of us would make a concerted effort to try to become the saint that God calls us to be. As Leon Blois says, the biggest tragedy in our life would be if we do not arrive at the saint that God calls us to be. My second intention would be I'd like to pray for your families, for your children as well as your teenagers. Yesterday I celebrated Mass for the Confirmation students and I think we have to pray a lot for them. They're being exposed to so many different currents. Parents came up to me last night and they said, Father, we heard your homily on Sunday and we are preoccupied about the education of our teenagers. We're considering homeschooling. And that was something that I mentioned in my homily that homeschooling is a very value, very viable option today because of the many errors that the public school is forcing upon our children. Especially the transgender agenda that that's being forced upon so many young people, which is anti-biblical, it's against natural law, it's against common sense, and it's just diabolical. So I'd like to pray for you as parents that, that have to navigate your children through this very rocky sea where so many errors are being disseminated and spread far and wide on a national, almost a global basis. It's almost as if we're living in the time of Sodom and Gomorrah revisited. we got to pray more. So I'd like to pray for your, your children and that you as parents, who are called to be the first teachers of your children, that you would assume your responsibility as, as teachers to your, to your children. You're called to be the the good shepherd of the flock that is entrusted to you. My last intention would be that all of us would have a great desire within our hearts to pray more and to pray better. Our sanctification, our sanctification depends upon our prayer life. Pray for Andrew, whose birthday it is today. Many good intentions that you're placing. Father Pius in St. John the God is in a critical condition in the hospital. We'll pray for him also. All these intentions I'm placing on the altar right now. These intentions are prayer intentions. But last but not least, as I was saying, that all of us would have a great desire to to grow in our prayer life. We would give time, effort, and goodwill. Very frequently at this juncture of our conversation, I give a very brief catechesis or exhortation on prayer. And this time I'd say, let's pray for each other. Because what I'm trying to do with all of you is form all of us into a family that we're being united in the love of Jesus and Mary, in prayer, in the Mass, in the, sacra in the sacraments, in the Eucharist. Let's pray for each other, that God would help us all to get to heaven. That's really why we're here. We're here, we're here in this life for a very short time, and the purpose of our life is to get to heaven. As Jesus said, what would it profit a man if he gains the whole world 
and he loses his soul. So very briefly today there's is a feast of Saint Bruno who was born in Germany. He lived from 1030 to about 1101 and he was a very famous professor in the university. He left the university to dedicate himself to prayer and solitude. He went with another six men on the top of the Alps and they set up a chapel and these little houses and he founded what is what is called the Carthusian order in each little house every monk would live or hermit would live the house would have three rooms the bedroom a place for prayer and a place for work so this is the founding of the Carthusian order Saint Bruno my founder his name is Father Bruno and Terry, he started off his life in the Carthusians for a short time, but that was not for him. But the essence of the Carthusian life is solitude, silence, prayer, penance, and union with God. So let's pray that we, we would have, in a certain sense, a Carthusian heart, that we should be longing for solitude silence, prayer, so that we can be united with Christ. St. Bruno. Now, the readings today, I'd like to focus especially on the Gospel reading, but let's just start our biblical conversation with the first reading. So these, uh, for three days, the church is giving us a relatively short book from the Old Testament from the prophet Jonah. So just an overview of this and some practical conclusions. Book of Jonah, Jonah is a prophet. God tells Jonah to go to Nineveh to preach conversion. Jonah goes in the opposite direction. He jumps on a ship going toward Tarshish. He did not want to go to Nineveh. God sends a storm upon the sea. The sailors confront Jonah. He asks him who he is, what is his religion, what is his mission. Jonah says that he's running away from God. They're shocked and they say, why did he do this? They throw over the cargo from the ship, but the storm gets even worse, so they decide to throw Jonah into the sea. Then the sea calms down once Jonah is thrown into the sea. Providentially, providentially, there is a big fish that is swimming near the ship. The big fish opens up his mouth and swallows Jonah. So Jonah is in the belly of the whale for three days and three nights. Then the fish vomits Jonah there on the shore of Nineveh. And Jonah, now he obeys what God has told him to do from the outset. And he preaches and he says that in 40 days Nineveh will be destroyed. The news of this preaching, in which there's a city of thousands and thousands of people, reaches the ears of the king. And the king proclaims a universal fast. From the oldest to the youngest, even children and animals have to wear sackcloth and sit in ashes. God looks down upon them and tells Jonah, look, they have changed. There's a change of heart, therefore I will not chastise them. Jonah becomes very angry. He says, Lord, I prefer to die. So Jonah leaves the city. He goes to the east. He builds a little hut. And God sends Jonah a gourd, which is a big plant, 
which is able to provide Jonah with shade from the heat. And then God sends a worm that eats at the gourd plant and it withers up and dies. Jonah says it once again, Lord, let me die. Then God intervenes and says, why are you complaining? You did not bring that gourd plant into existence and you did not take it away. Why should we be worried about a gourd plant? Then God ends by saying, look, these thousands of people, these thousands of people in Nineveh that don't know their left hand from their right, should not I have had mercy on them? What about all these cattle, these animals? So there we have, I've given you a, a succinct summary of this wonderful book of Jonah. Three conclusions. Number one, we are sometimes like Jonah. Yes, we are. In this sense, that God called Jonah to carry out a mission which was not easy, a difficult mission. And Jonah ran away, resisting to do God's will. Sometimes God tells us to do certain things and we say no, like Jonah. God tells us to go north and we go south. God tells us to come and we go. So the book of Jonah we can apply to ourselves in the fact that we at times we do resist God's voice in our lives. We do resist God's will. Second is that God has ways of carrying out his will which are different than ours. Who would have ever thought that Jonah would be, would be saved in the belly of a whale? God's ways are not our ways. As the heavens are above the earth, so are our God's ways above our ways. <laughs> As the heavens are above the earth, so are God's ways above our ways. And the third point is that Jonah wanted justice and he wanted these people to be destroyed. Possibly because these Ninevites had made the Jewish people suffer a lot. Jonah. <laughs> Excuse me. Jonah wanted revenge. But we see in God not a vindictive, angry, vengeful attitude, but rather God, our God is a God of great mercy. So the book of Jonah is short. Excuse me, allergies. The book of Jonah is very short. It's only four chapters. So you might even just read through the whole book of Jonah today. Spend some time with it. The book of Jonah. So the book of Jonah is, uh, is a powerful book, very short, but a book that has deep meaning. The responsorial psalm for the Mass today is, Lord, you are merciful and gracious. It's taken from Psalm 86. Lord, you are merciful and gracious. Yesterday we celebrated the feast day of St. Faustina Kowalska. And one of the hallmarks of the life of St. Faustina is the whole idea of mercy. That she wrote the diary of divine mercy in my soul. So as we pray this responsorial psalm in the Mass today, we repeat, 
Lord, you are merciful and gracious. Let us ourselves try to experience God's infinite mercy in our lives. But also that we would try to be merciful. Because mercy means God's love for giving the sinner. Mercy has to be mercy has to be a two-way street. If I want to receive mercy, then I have to I have to give mercy. Okay, now I'd like to move to the gospel today, which is a very important gospel. Only four verses, but it's very, very dense and packed with meaning. So the gospel today, it starts off, it's Luke chapter 11, verse 1 to 4. The disciples are with Jesus. And Jesus is apart from the disciples and he's praying. He's praying in a certain place. We see this happening with a certain frequency. Our Lord is with the apostles. He's preaching. He's teaching. He's healing. He's carrying out miracles. He's casting out demons. He's helping people. He's battling with the Pharisees. Then he pulls back. He pulls back so that he can find a place of solitude and silence so that he can enter into dialogue with his Heavenly Father. So that's what we have in the Gospel today. So the Apostles were, they were watching our Lord as he prayed. So as a result of his good example, the apostles request our Lord. They ask him to teach them how to pray. The exact words, Lord, teach us how to pray just as John taught his disciples. So some of these apostles were actually in the school of John the Baptist. And one of the essential elements of the teaching of John the Baptist was the importance of, of prayer. So they request their Lord, Lord, teach us how to pray. And from this, we have the Lord's Prayer. Now, you can find the Lord's Prayer in the Gospel of Matthew. And you can find the Lord's Prayer also today in Luke, chapter 11, verse 1 to 4. There are slight variations in the Our Father in Matthew as well as Luke. But the essence is the same. given that this is the most important prayer in the world, prayed by millions of people in 2,000 years. I'd like to just throw out some bibliographical references that you can consult to get to know the Our Father better and better. Here, the first would be the Catechism of the Catholic Church. The Catechism of the Catholic Church explains the Our Father word for word. There are actually seven petitions. Then you can read Teresa of Avila. The Way of Perfection is basically a commentary on the Our Father. Then you have the great teacher in the early church, St. Cyprian, is written on the Our Father. St. Augustine is also written on the Our Father. Then the book written by St. Louis de Montfort, The Secret of the Rosary, explains the Hail Mary and the Our Father word for word. Now, before going into the explanation of the Our Father itself, I'd also like to make this suggestion. 
Sena Nesha Loyola proposes various ways to pray. Vocal prayer, mental prayer, meditation, contemplation, various ways of praying. But another way in which she suggests is to take a formal prayer that you know, like the Hail Mary, the Glory Be, maybe the Creed, or the Our Father, and just take it a word at a time and relish those words. You're saying like, Our Father, Loving Father, Tender Father, Merciful Father, Compassionate Father, Powerful Father, My Father. Which you're taking these words and which you said the Our Father many, many times in your life. But this is the opportunity for your holy hour to just take this prayer and to go through it very slowly, pondering, relishing. In Spanish, the word is saboreando. You're relishing these words of the Lord's Prayer. So that's a suggestion before you go into your holy hour with the Our Father. So let's take the prayer and we'll we'll go as far as time permits. And I'd like to just take the Our Father, the prayer, also known as the Lord's Prayer. Let's just take it uh, a word at a time. And allow the Holy Spirit to help you to plumb the depths of this prayer that came from the heart of Christ himself. So let's start with our, our Father. Now Jesus could, Jesus could have said, my Father. He could have. But he purposely our Lord purposely took the word our. The word our. Why? Well, for many reasons. One of the principal reasons why Jesus said our Father is this. He wants us to recognize that heaven is a family, the Trinity is a family, the Holy Family is the greatest of all families. But God wants us to recognize that the world in which we live is composed of people in different times, places, cultures, However, all of us are created in the image and likeness of God. If we're baptized, we are sons and daughters of God. But all people that God has brought into existence have the two Ds. This innate dignity and eternal destiny. That's right. This innate dignity. We all have dignity. Pope John Paul II insisted in, law, in many, many of his writings to respect the dignity of the human person. Respect our own innate dignity. Every person in this world has great dignity and importance. And every person in this world has destiny. The destiny is heaven. And that's part of the Our Father also. 
Our Father who art in heaven. It's part of the Our Father. What is the what is the opposite of recognizing our dignity and our destiny? If we do not have God in our lives, and this pandemic, this world pandemic that we're going through, should bring us to our senses to recognize that God has sent us this pandemic. And only God can resolve this. So like in the book of Jonah, these people were converted. Or is our world, some people, but many people have not been converted yet. God is sending this universal pandemic with variations, people getting sick, some are dying. God is saying, you have to turn to me. I'm the only one that can resolve this. Sure, use certain human means, you know, sanitizer, put the mask on if you like, or, you know, use certain means, social distancing, fine. But rely even more on God. Rely more on God. Now, what happens? What happens when we do not recognize our dignity or the dignity of others. What happens? Then instead of respecting that person who's created in the image and likeness of God, then we, this is John Paul II again, instead of respecting, then we utilize that person as an object. We utilize that person as an object instead of recognizing that innate dignity of that person. That person becomes simply an object to be exploited, to be exploited, to be used, to be utilized, and then to be discarded, almost like a Coca-Cola bottle. So, our Father, we say our, we're saying that God is our, God is our Father. And all of us, all of us are brothers and sisters from our same Father God. Therefore, we should try to put into practice the last and greatest commandments of Jesus Christ. That is, Jesus said, love one another as I have loved you. That is the greatest of all the commandments and it summarizes all the other Ten Commandments. Love one another as I have loved you. If you like certain connections, the Our Father is related to one of the gifts of the Holy Spirit. That gift is piety. What is piety? Piety is a gift of the Holy Spirit in which we recognize our sonship or daughtership of the Eternal Father. but also our relationship with others who indeed are, they are our brothers and sisters. So our divine filiation as sons and daughters of God, but also our family relationship. So what would go against this Our Father? Well, xenophobia, any form of racism, any form of prejudice, any form of looking down upon any person because of his age, his race, the color of his skin, 
his lack of education, maybe his lack of money, whatever it might be, looking down upon someone in pride, in feeling ourselves superior to others. We should try, like Vincent de Paul and the Saints, and we should try to be servants to others, as, as the saying goes, to serve is to reign, and to reign is to serve. So there we have the very beginning of the Lord's Prayer hour. Let's move on to the next word. Our Father. The word Father. Let's talk about that. In the Aramaic, the word would be Abba. That's the, the language of Jesus Christ. That's Abba. Abba means daddy. Spanish papi. In Italian, babo. It's a very endearing way in which we address God himself. So when you're going through the word father, Try to try to plumb the depths of really what it means. God's paternity. What does it mean, our Father? So let's go through some of the some of the characteristics of what it really means to be Father. Some of you are fathers. You call us priests, Father, Father Broom, Padre. Okay, the nature of a father, the nature of a father is the following. A father engenders or gives life. So in the Trinity, we have God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. God the Father engenders the Son. The Son reflects the Father. And the mutual love between the Father and the Son is the Holy Spirit. So the first aspect or attribute of Father or Fatherhood is what? Is a Father, by his nature, engenders or gives life. That's right. A father engenders or gives life. So the opposite of fatherhood would be destroying life. So in a certain sense, when we capitulate to abortion or euthanasia or hatred, that is diametrically opposed, the negation of the essence of paternity, of really what it means to be a father. How true. How true. Father. What are other attributes or characteristics of father? Not only does a father engender give life but also father a good father will both protect and defend his children. If you like, you can actually apply the image of the shepherd. As Jesus says, I am the good shepherd. I know my sheep and they know me. The good shepherd is not like the marauder who sees the wolf coming and flees. But rather, the Good Shepherd gives his life for his sheep. So a good father will both defend and protect his sons and daughters. You see the Good Shepherd holding the staff to walk, but also to ward off the wolves 
from invading the flock and devouring the sheep. What other attribute? Well, also a father, a father really knows his sons and daughters. He knows who they are. He knows their needs. He knows their wants. He knows their vulnerability. He knows them. So does God the Father know us. So does God the Father want to defend us and protect us. So a good father is going to be watching over his children. Then also a good father will provide. A good father will provide for his children. Provide providence. That's why when God created man and woman, he told the woman that she was called to bring forth children into the world. Whereas the man, Adam, it was different. That he was called to earn his bread by the sweat of his brow. So we see in the initial command of God in the very first book of the Bible, women are, are called to bring forth children in pain and then to raise children. But also, the father is called to work hard, to sweat, to provide for his wife and his children. What is another characteristic? What is another characteristic of the father? Well, the father will also heal his son or daughter if the son or daughter has been wounded or become sick. Love that beautiful image of Jesus as a good shepherd placing the sheep, the wounded sheep on his shoulders. That's a good image of what a father should be like the healing, the wounded child. And we're all wounded in many ways. And I've said before, either we become wounded wounders or wounded healers. Also, another important element of the Our Father, and you are just logging in, we're talking about the prayer of the Our Father because today... The apostles turned to Jesus after he's prayed and says, Lord, teach us to pray as John taught his disciples to pray. So I'm going through the Our Father very slowly, a word at a time. Our Father. Another element of a father as we, re we see reflected in our eternal father, is a good father. Uh, our father is always present to us. Whenever we want, we want to talk to the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, the Blessed Trinity. The Father is never too busy for us. The Father is never too busy for us. The Father always has time for us. I repeat, the Father is never too busy for us. He always has time for us. So I'd like to apply this to the earthly father. We live in a world 
in which very often fathers as well as mothers they don't seem to have they don't seem to have time for their children but we have to make time for our children otherwise they'll leave home and we never really got to know our children Let me tell you a story. This is one of my favorite stories related to the importance of the presence of the father in the life of his child. And it's this. There's a father who had a son who was about eight years old. The father was a very hard worker. He worked from dawn tonight and his son barely had time to be with his father so one occasion the father arrives home from work at about nine o'clock and his eight-year-old son is already in his in his bed and the son hears the door close and his father walking in and Father goes into the kitchen, puts something in the microwave, and then he hears the voice of his son, Dad, Dad, come here. So he goes into the room of his son and says, Dad, I'd like to ask you a question. Yes. Um, how much money do you make every hour at work? And the father says, well, that's really none of your business. Well, just tell me. He says, well, I make $20, $20 an hour. So the father goes into the kitchen, puts his meal in the microwave. And about five minutes later, he hears the voice, Dad, 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 come here. And he um, goes into the room of his son and said, what do you want, son? said, do me a favor, give me $10. $10? Yeah, I want $10. So begrudgingly, the father opens up his wallet and hands over a $10 bill to his son. So the father goes back into the kitchen and he pulls his plate out of the microwave, sits down to eat, and five minutes later, he hears... Dad, 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 come here. So frustrated, the father leaves his meal on the table. He goes into the room of his son. And the son says, look, Dad, open up your hands. So the father opens up his hands and the son returns the $10 bill. And he gives him a $5 bill. And he gives him four ones. He gives him three quarters, he gives him two dimes, and five pennies. And he says, Dad, you can count it, but this is $20. I'm going to give it to you so that I can buy an hour of your time. So that I can buy an hour of your time. Buy an hour of your time. I know it's a very strong story. It's kind of a tearjerker. But I think all of us can identify with that. How often in our lives... How often it happens in our lives that we say these words, sorry, I simply don't have the time. Sorry, I simply don't have the time. But really it's a misnomer. It's a misnomer because we all have time. 
We all have 24 hours in the day. The big question is, how do we use these 24 hours in the day? How do we use it? Do we use the time properly or do we maybe waste some of that time that God has given to us? Because you all have 24 hours. For that reason, in the spiritual exercises program, I strongly recommend that all of us write, write out a plan of life. The last book that I had published by 10 publishers, the name of the book is Roadmap to Heaven. My book Roadmap to Heaven is basically, it's a plan of life, three different plans of life that we can write out so that we can order the disorder in our lives. So we don't want to be among the many who say, I don't have time. It's a misnomer. Because we have time to eat. We have time for our telephone. We have time for social activities. But sad to say, often we don't have time for God and maybe we don't have time for our children. So when we say, Our Father, we're saying, recognizing that God is our Father. God has a great love for us. God is omnipresent. God is omniscient. Wherever we go, God is present. So what I'm doing today, we're going through the Our Father and we're just going through the first two words, Our Father, is I would like to also highlight another important attribute of the essence of what it means to be a father. What is another most, I would say the most salient attribute of the father is that the father loves the son. The nature of a father is the father not only does he give birth to the son, but the father also loves the son. He loves the son. And with the word love, yesterday we did celebrate the memorial of St. Faustino. In the diary of St. Faustino, The Diary of St. Faustino, we have the following. St. Faustino says we, we can measure love by our willingness to suffer for the loved one. That's how love is measured. Love, love is measured by the willingness to suffer for the loved one. And a true father is willing to suffer for his wife and his children. Once I was having a conversation on the word love, and I actually asked my, asked my mother, what do you think love is? How would, you, how would you define love? She gave a very short but a very good definition. And she said, love is sacrifice. Great definition. Love is sacrifice. 
and sacrifice is related to suffering. And we see this most eloquently in our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ as we contemplate Jesus on the cross. So I invite all of you today, I invite all of you today to pray the Our Father. But pray the Our Father as St. Ignatius Loyola suggests. Without any hurry. I've only gotten through two words. Our Father. Recognize that all of us are brothers and sisters because if God is our Father, all of us are brothers and sisters in Christ. And Father, my friends, God the Father has given you life. God the Father defends you. God the Father protects you. God the Father is present to you. God the Father has provided for your needs up to this point. God the Father loves you, loves you to the point that he has sacrificed his only beloved son for you. How great God is. How much we should appreciate God's love for us. So, what I'd like to do is I'd like to end our conversation by giving you my priestly blessing. Let's pray for each other that we would experience the great love that our Heavenly, Heavenly Father has for each and every one of us. The Lord be with you. Through the intercession, through the intercession of Mary, St. Joseph, God's angels and saints, may God bless you in a very special way today that you would experience the love and tenderness of your Heavenly Father and Mary, your mother. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.